Well, hello and welcome to Zoom session number two for 125 Hearing Disorders. I believe today's date is, we are talking June the 10th, 2019. So here we go. What we want to do today is reach the end of outer and middle ear pathology or disorders. Last week we stuck mainly to outer ear, but then we also got into a little bit about the biggest uh, middle ear pathology, which is otitis media. Oto ear, itis inflammation, media middle. So without any further ado, why don't we share screen and go to look at our notes here and PowerPoints and all that good stuff. So pull up the notes first. Here we are. So we were on the top of the page. I mean, we got all the way down through all this myringotomy stuff and myringoplasty stuff and tympanoplasty, all that stuff, monomeric eardrum. We looked a little bit about how big, how big, what's, what is the uh, hearing loss caused by outer ear, ear pathology? Not that much, just a little bit, okay? You don't get very much hearing loss due to wax. You don't get very much hearing loss due to osteoma, swimmer's ear, all that stuff, because as long as you can see past the wax, or if you see a stenosis, in other words, not a complete closure like atresia, but stenosis, which is a partial closing of the ear canal, you will have no hearing loss whatsoever. So outer ear pathology does not tend to cause much hearing loss unless you have complete blockage of the outer ear canal, and even then, the loss isn't very much. It might be 10 to 20 decibels. So we also talked a little bit about collapsing canals last week or last Thursday, and this happens in the elderly. So look at your Zoom session from last week. They are losing cartilage in the middle ear, uh, in the outer ear and so when tight fitting headphones especially circum oral headphones the tdh 39 circum oral headphones can collapse the adults ear canals a bit and this will cause a little bit of a high frequency air bone gap always remember to think about air bone gaps when you think about pathology of the middle ear or outer ear. So if that, let's see if I can show you a picture here. Okay, here would be collapsed ear canals during air conduction testing. You can see that the adult person here has a high frequency hearing loss. The hearing goes down in the high frequencies. Hearing levels by bone conduction are similar to air conduction hearing thresholds until you get to the high frequencies, which is an air bone gap. And that's very unusual. Most conductive hearing loss caused by outer and middle ear pathology begins really more as a low frequency air bone gap and then spreads to the higher frequencies. Let's see if we can go to an, here's a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a rump here. There's a picture out of a textbook showing a left ear mild hearing loss normal hearing for the right ear. Now this is out of a textbook by Martin, and he sometimes does funny symbols for bone conduction. Leave the weird symbols alone because usually I look at stuff like this that I'm circling here. I think he's kind of looking at forehead placement of the bone conduction oscillator, which is weird. No one does that today, but at any rate, right ear is normal, left ear has an air bone gap. And you can see this one's done by external or caused by external otitis, it says. So external, outer, oto, ear, itis, inflammation. Probably a big problem in the outer ear canal. Perhaps uh, the whole ear canal is kind of swollen shut due to some infection in the left ear. And so therefore the person has a mild hearing loss in the, across the frequencies. Here's otitis media. And this is really what we want to look at today. We begin with otitis media. Notice the air bone gap for both ears. <clears throat> Look closely at this audiogram. It's common in children. Notice that the hearing for the right and left ears is fairly flat. 
because conductive hearing loss, the blockage of sound getting to the ear, conductive, okay, always think of conductive meaning a plug in the ear. You literally have a plug in the ear, whether it's caused by external otitis or whether it's caused by middle ear infection, okay, either way. You can see that the bone oscillator was placed behind the left ear. Look where I'm circling, the greater than signs like in mathematics. And the way to remember these always is to think of the client facing you. If the client is facing you, his or her left ear will stick out like this. So you know that the greater than going to the right is always the left ear. Okay, so left bone oscillator placed behind the left ear shows normal hearing. Then they put the bone oscillator behind the right ear and they used masking to keep the good ear, to keep the other ear busy. And sure enough, this is the the the, le the bracket going to the left indicates, okay. So this this here indicates the left ear, this indicates the right ear and the right ear, and the right ear, and the right ear, okay? If they had put the bone oscillator behind the right ear to begin with, and used masking to figure out what the hearing was like in the left ear by bone conduction, then these greater than signs would show less than, less than, less than, and then the brackets would be facing like my cursor's going, okay? But that's audiometry. Mainly from this course, look at the air bone gap. Significant. In other words, hearing by bone conduction is normal. When you bypassed the outer ear by putting an oscillator, now put your hand on that bone behind your ear. When you put an oscillator or something there and you're delivering tones through that, you are bypassing the outer ear and bypassing the middle ear. And you are stimulating the cochlea directly. Okay, so hearing by bone conduction was normal. And that's a good piece of news for the parent because it means that the hair cells of the cochlea are fine. It's just that there's a blockage of sound getting to the inner ear. And that's why the X's and O's are showing a flat, moderate degree of hearing loss. What kind of hearing loss? Conductive. So there's three things here, okay? The shape, flat. The degree, moderate. And the type. Shape, degree, type. Flat, moderate, conductive hearing loss. What's it caused by? Usually otitis media. If you're looking here, this would be a mild, flat, conductive hearing loss for the left ear. This is a bilateral, flat, moderate, conductive loss. Notice it says on the left here, the slight improvement at 2000 hertz. That is because the resonance of the middle ear ossicles is 2000 hertz. Okay, so now without any further ado, let's look at our notes and carry on from where we were last week. All right, otitis media. And we touched on this last week. Let's take a running start at this. Seen in 70% of Americans before age two. Half the kids experience it again and again. It begins with upper respiratory infection, in other words, sore throat. Make sure you read this carefully, okay? The eustachian tube isn't opening when you're swallowing. Remember, the eustachian tube is always closed and less forced open, okay? It opens when you yawn, when you swallow. So the tissue lining in the middle ear space, the muco mucosal lining of the middle ear space, okay, absorbs air. So you're now getting negative middle ear pressure because you're getting a vacuum in the middle ear. No new air is getting in when you swallow because you've got eustachian tube dysfunction. The tympanic membrane retracts, gets sucked inward, leading to a type C tympanogram. What is that? Make sure we know what it is. So let's go and look at a type C tympanogram. There you go. So 
So look at these tympanograms carefully. On the horizontal axis, you've got air pressure. On the vertical axis, you have what's called compliance. How compliant is the middle ear? How stiff is the middle ear, in other words? So as you go at the bottom of this axis, when you have low compliance, you have lots of stiffness. When you have lots of compliance at the top where I'm circling here, you have least stiffness. Now write this down in the margins of your notes. The middle ear is a stiffness-dominated system. It doesn't have much mass. It doesn't have much resistance. Most of the middle ear's opposition to the passage of sound is caused by its stiffness. So what does tympanometry do? They put a probe in your ear canal, and the probe's got three holes. One is a speaker. The other one's a mic to pick up what sound is bouncing off your drum. And the third one changes air pressure. So this three-pronged probe is stuck in your ear canal. It's just a little rubber tip with three little holes in it. And a low-pitched sound is coming out of the probe. 250 hertz, around there. And they're using a low pitch because stiffness opposes lows. Remember from acoustics? Stiffness resonates with highs. It opposes lows. So a low pitch tone is coming out of the speaker of that probe, and your, your mic is picking up how much sound is bouncing back. And you're measuring the amount of sound bouncing back as you change the air pressure in your ear canal. That probe's got to be airtight. So first, they make positive air pressure. How much sound is bouncing back? And then normal air pressure, and then negative air pressure. How much sound is bouncing back off the drum as you change air pressure? Share screen. Look at the picture. This is a type A tympanogram, normal. It means least sound bounced back. Look where my I'm circling here. The, ear, the middle ear system was least stiff. It's always stiff, but it's least stiff when air pressure is even steven on both sides of the drum. If the air pressure is even on both sides of the drum, you will have greatest compliance of the middle ear and least stiffness, meaning a little bit of sound is getting through. Not all of it's bouncing back. A little bit of that low pitch tone is getting through. Remember, you're using a low pitch because stiff objects don't like the lows. You have to use a low pitch, otherwise you've got nothing to measure coming back. Okay, that's why, W-H-Y, how come they use a low pitch tone in tympanometry. Okay, so you're using a low pitch tone because it always is going to bounce back off of a stiff system. And you're finding out at what air pressure does least sound bounce back. And that's the peak of the, ear, uh, of the tympanogram, shaped like a pup tent. Least sound bounced back at normal air pressure in the ear canal. Okay? So when the probe was using normal air pressure in the ear canal, least of the low pitch sound bounced back. Some of it got through. For example, if 70 dB of the tone was coming out of the probe, Maybe 35 got through and only 35 bounced back. But when you had positive air pressure, look where my cursor is in the ear canal. Remember the probe is airtight. Positive air pressure, almost all of the sound bounced back. And at negative air pressure, all of the sound bounced back. And when all the sound bounced back, that means the ear, the middle ear is least compliant. And that's where I'm circling. It has less compliance. It's more stiff. Remember, the middle ear system is a stiffness-dominated system, and it's least stiff when air pressure is even steven on both sides of the drum. So you're playing around with air pressure in the ear canal and a tone emitted, and you're measuring the amount of that tone that's bouncing back as you change air pressure. And if the peak of your tympanogram is over zero air pressure, it means that the air pressure in the middle ear space is zero, normal. 
So air pressure when it was normal in the ear canal was even with the air pressure behind the eardrum, least of the sound bounced back. And that means you had most compliance at normal air pressure. If you have a type C, <clears throat> look at the type C tympanogram. It's got a peak too, but it's over negative air pressure. Meaning the middle ear was least stiff when I made the air pressure in the ear canal negative. And that must mean that the air pressure behind the drum is negative. Okay, remember, the greatest compliance of the middle ear, least sound bouncing back, in other words, is when air pressure is even on both sides of the drum. So if the peak is over negative air pressure, it must mean that the air pressure behind the drum is negative. And that is an indication of early otitis media. Remember what it begins as? A vacuum behind the, behind the eardrum. So now the middle ear is sucked back. The eardrum is sucked back. It's retracted. And you can, might be able to visualize that with your otoscope, but guess what? You also measured it with tympanometry. And now your type C is turning into a type B. And that means you're now getting serous fluid behind the drum. Remember last week, serous fluid, the next stage of otitis media, non-infectious fluid behind the drum, like the fluid under a blister. And you can sometimes see bubbles in it, okay? That's the next stage of otitis media. What's the next one? Suppurative or purulent. Remember this from last week? Suppurative or purulent otitis media means now the, the, the fluid has turned white and now it's pus. So your type C now is changing to a type B. You're losing your peak and now you've got a type B on the bottom, which means no peak, flat tympanogram. And a flat tympanogram means the middle ear is filled with fluid. Air pressure can't compete with fluid. So at no air pressure, positive, regular, or negative, did you ever get a peak on a tympanogram? That means you've got advanced otitis media. No peak whatsoever. No matter what you did with the air pressure, all the sound bounced back off the drum. And how come? Because the eardrum was bulged outward with pus. So type A, Type C, type B. Why it doesn't go A, B, C is beyond me, but just memorize type A is normal, type C is a peak over negative air pressure, and type B is a flat tympanogram. A normal, C early otitis media, vacuum behind the drum, B fluid behind the drum. Good. Now we can escape out of this slide and look more at our notes once again. Okay, there you go. Leading to a type C tympanogram, early otitis media, the tympanic membrane often looks vascular and becomes reddened. Serous otitis media, number stage two here, type B tympanogram. A meniscus is a fluid line against the TM that can become visible as the fluid level rises. Sometimes you see that, sometimes you don't. Suppurative otitis media, Pus accumulates, pain and fever begin. If the condition continues, the tympanic membrane may perforate. Pus that cannot find its way out of the middle ear may invade the mastoid cavities. Remember the mastoid bone, soft and porous. You don't want infection <clears throat> getting into the mastoid bone because then you have mastoiditis. When you have mastoiditis, it, antibiotics will no longer help. Now you need surgery to burr away the mastoid bone. Put your finger behind your ear. That little bump of bone is burred away. And sometimes the ossicles are removed. They call that a mastoidectomy, done to save your life. Because the roof of your middle ear space is less than half an inch from the base of your brain. Mastoiditis untreated leads to meningitis, which is an inflammation of the sac that surrounds the brain. And when you get meningitis, you usually die. So the term 
Separative versus purulent are often found interchangeably. Separative refers to something causing the production of the pus. Purulent is the pus itself. Either way, the terms are used interchangeably. Mucous otitis media, often called glue ear, thick mucoid secretion, dense and dark in color, chronic, it's from long-standing, repeated bouts of otitis media when the crud never actually completely clears out of the middle ear space at all. You've got old, junky, infectious junk hanging around the sides of your middle ear space and the bones themselves. Tympanosclerosis, adhesions and thickening areas, calcium deposits left on the tympanic membrane even after treatment. And we showed you tons of pictures of eardrums last week. But uh, there you have it, okay? Why don't we just kind of look at that once again and see if we can't find that in our slides. It's just to show you what that might look like. There you go, this slide right here. There you can see tympanosclerosis. Looks like a grub, something you found on your lawn. Oh, it's gross, but at any way, <coughs> you can see that this is the right ear because the, the cone of light is at five o'clock, manubrium of the malleus, umbo, and this person no longer has otitis media, but there's a scarring area on the eardrum where it may have punctured or God knows what happened. Read it. These patches of hyalinization and calcification on the tympanic membrane are constantly associ associated with the insertion of vent of PE tubes, pressure equalizing tubes. Even though they've grown out, you've got some scar tissue on the drum. So anyway. Retracted eardrum, cholesteatoma, all kinds of lovely things we can talk about. So let's move now in our otitis media notes. And again, in untreated cases of otitis media, mastoiditis. I'll let you read that. Okay? You may see this in sometimes in elderly clients, a deep hole behind the ear. You can't see it very well. You have to look because it's, the, it's this crack behind your ear, but that bone is no longer there. They've got an indent. And it's because they did not get treated well for otitis media. That doesn't happen too commonly today. That's why I say you'll see it mostly in elderly people that did not get good treatment with otitis media perhaps after World War II, who knows, okay? If you see a mastoidectomy, be very careful in taking ear mold impressions, EMIs. Have a surgeon pack the mastoid cavity before taking an ear mold impression for a hearing aid, but we'll let your clinic talk to you more about that. In very rare cases, meningitis can develop from untreated mastoiditis. Look at this. The roof of your middle ear space is only an eighth of an inch from the base of your brain. Usually fatal. Here's the treatment for otitis media. We talked about this last week. Okay, so memorize those. Antibiotics, we're becoming immune to them. Pressure equalizing tubes is a way to not use medication and still treat otitis media. They're puncturing the eardrum, myringotomy, inserting a tiny little tube into the hole of the eardrum, thus allowing air pressure to become even steven on both sides of the drum. Okay, if the eustachian tubes aren't working properly, screw it. Let's put a hole in the drum and use the front door. If the back door ain't working, let's use the front door. That's literally what PE tubes are for. They do a myringotomy, suction out the flat bacterial fluid, stick a plastic tube through the hole, and it acts as a secondary eustachian tube to equalize air pressure in the middle ear space. So a vacuum can never begin, and an infection can't begin thereafter. Tonsillectomies are sometimes done to allow the eustachian tube to function even better with a sore throat because you are, you are 
getting rid of the swelling, you've removed the tonsils. What are your tonsils for? Your tonsils are tiny little sponges meant to absorb bacteria. That's why you have them. But in today's day and age, they often become the source of the problem themselves. That's why they're often removed. When they remove the tonsils, the eustachian tubes can stay open easier. And thus, you don't get otitis media. So, audiometry in otitis media begins as a low-frequency air bone gap. Low frequency. 250 hertz, 500 hertz, and 1,000 hertz, and then the air bone gap closes. Okay, normal hearing, but a bit of an air bone gap, a bit of hearing loss by air conduction, but bone conduction being normal. Sometimes you'll see a slight rise at 2000 hertz in the air conduction thresholds due to the middle ear ossicles resonance. Ranges from mild in degree to moderate in degree. Memorize mild to moderate. Normal hearing, 25 or better. In a child, 15 or better. So mild losses are anywhere from 15 to about 40 dB. And beyond 40, you're now in the moderate range. 40 to 60 is moderate. Speech audiometry by air conduction, elevated speech reception thresholds. Now, let's look at this carefully. What does middle ear pathology cause? It's a plug in the ear. What's SRT? Speech reception threshold. The softest it took for you to hear two-syllable words, spondy words. And the two-syllable words are made up of two little words. Meatball, cupcake, armchair. Woodwork, hardware, ice cream, snowman, get it? So you, <clears throat> the examiner, are now giving the client words. And you've te your your these spondy words, you're finding the softest level it takes for your client to just barely hear those words. And that SRT, speech reception threshold, is just like pure tone testing. Pure tone testing, what's the softest it took for you to hear the tones? SRT is what's the softest it took to hear those two-syllable spondy words. So you're getting thresholds for tones, thresholds for speech. And they better agree. The pure tone average, the average hearing levels at 500, 1,000 and 2,000, five, one, and two. Add them up, divide by three. That's your pure tone average. Parent Teachers Association, get it? Threshold at 500, threshold at 1,000, threshold of 2,000 hertz by air conduction, okay? Add them up, divide by three, you've got your pure tone average. Your SRT should agree with your pure tone average. Should be within plus or minus five dB of it. We have a saying in this field, what's 5 dB among friends? So if your pure tone average is 40 and your SRT is 35, you're good to go. But if your pure tone average is 40 and your SRT is 20, uh-uh, there's a problem, okay? Either you don't know what you're doing or your audiometer is out of calibration or your client is lying, okay? Those, it's a fairly ironclad thing. So now let's look at share screen once again and go back to it. What's an MCL? Your most comfortable loudness levels. What was your most comfortable loudness level for hearing speech? That's a second speech test. The first one's SRT, the second one is MCL. And for normal hearing people, average speech, what did we say in acoustics is 65 dB SPL. In, that's, that's in SPL, <clears throat> in dB HL. Hearing level on the audiogram, average MCL is between 50 and 60. Memorize that, okay? Average MCL is between 50 and 60. Well, if you've got a plug in your ear, 
your MCL is going to be elevated. Obviously, I'm going to have to talk louder for you to find your, that, that comfortable. So your SRTs are going to be elevated because you've got your pure tone averages are elevated. Your MCLs are elevated. But at loud levels, at those elevated levels, the clarity of your hearing is fantastic. The clarity. And that's what we mean by word recognition. Speech discrimination is done in single syllable words. Say the word cow. Say the word wall. Say the word up. Single syllable words. And those <coughs> are read to the client at the client's most comfortable loudness level, whether normal or whether elevated. By gum, you do it at their MCL. And with conductive hearing loss, they usually get 100% of the words. Why? Because there's no damage to the hair cells. The cochlea is just fine. You've just got a plug in the ear. So if you raise up the volume, the guy's going to hear you just fine. Just like if you have earplugs in and you don't take them out and I talk loudly to you, you're going to hear me. Okay? Conductive hearing loss. Pure tone average is elevated. Your thresholds are higher than they should be. In other words, worse. More decibels. Your speech reception thresholds are elevated and higher decibels. Your most comfortable loudness is elevated at higher decibels. But at those higher decibels, your speech discrimination, understanding the single syllable words, is 100%. I'm saying this repeatedly to you, so you really get the difference between conductive and sensory neural, because next week we're going to go into sensory neural, and sensory neural is completely different, okay? Sensory neural, the speech discrimination may not be 100%. When reading those single syllable words, the person may not do very well, even at a louder MCL, most comfortable loudness level. <clears throat> Sensory neural loss, yep, thresholds will be elevated worse than normal, yep, just like conductive. But sensory neural usually slopes down, usually has better hearing in the lows and worse in the highs. It's not flat because it's not a plug in the ear. With sensory neural loss, you have nothing wrong with the outer ear. You have nothing wrong with the middle ear. All those things are working just fine. Thank you very much. The trouble is in the cochlea snail-shaped hair cells. So, yep, sounds have to be made louder. But when you're testing by air conduction, you get a hearing loss. And when you bypass the outer ear and put the bone oscillator on the mastoid, the hearing doesn't get any better. It's the same. So if I had a 50 decibel hearing loss by air conduction, I'm going to have a 50 decibel hearing loss by bone conduction. There is no air bone gap. You get it? All right? That's sensory neural hearing loss. Inner ear pathology. The tympanograms will be normal, type A, because there's nothing wrong with the middle ear in sensory neural loss. And what's the most common sensory neural loss out there? Presbycusis. What's the second most common sensory neural loss? Noise-induced hearing loss. Both age and excessive noise kill off hair cells. But that's a topic for next week. We'll go into that manana. Today, we're sticking to outer and middle ear pathology. But we need to know that when you've got an air bone gap, a difference between the way you heard by air conduction versus bone conduction, with air always being worse, okay? Bone is never going to be worse than air. Bone is either going to be the same as air conduction thresholds, or it's going to be better than air conduction thresholds, okay? So if you've got an air bone gap, meaning you've got a blockage somewhere, thou shalt do tympanometry to back it up. Get it? So when you've got an air bone gap, a difference between the way you heard by air conduction versus the way you heard by bone conduction, share screen, show by example again, look at PowerPoint. Here we go. If you've got, let's go to the slide here. We want to really make sure we've got this because otherwise we're screwed. 
okay? This is sensory neural loss for the most part, but we don't really care about that one right now. Here, if you've got otitis media, or if you have findings like this audiogram, where the hearing by air conduction is, say, for example, in this case, 40 to 50, and the hearing by bone conduction is within normal limits, you got to do tympanometry to back it up. And guess what? Your otitis media air bone gap will likely be accompanied, oh, look at all this stuff, with an abnormal tympanogram, a type C or a type B. Okay, very, very important to retain that information. Always remember, conductive hearing loss is like a plug in the ear. Anything that would happen when you plug your ear happens with conductive hearing loss because that's exactly what conductive hearing loss is. And this one here, elevated UCLs, uncomfortable loudness levels. That's the fourth speech test, SRT, MCL, speech discrimination, and UCL, okay? Uncomfortable loudness level for a normal hearing person is gonna be around 100 dBHL. For someone with otitis media or outer external ear pathology or middle ear pathology, remember you got a plug in your ear. So bring it on, Jack. You can yell at me even louder. It's not gonna bother me, just like you wear headphones when you're mowing the lawn. Okay, your uncomfortable loudness level is elevated as well. Everything got worse. SRTs must agree with pure tone averages. They are done with two syllable spondy words. MCL is simply finding out the client's most comfortable loudness for hearing speech. The third test, speech discrimination or word recognition, same thing is done at MCL to test the clarity of someone's hearing. So you say to the client, these words aren't going to get any softer. They're going to stay the same. Just repeat them after me. And the fourth test, UCL, uncomfortable loudness level. So you've got three parts to the audiogram. The first part is pure tone testing, air and bone. The second part is speech testing. You've got four speech tests. And the third part is tympanometry, ABC. There you go. So tympanometry and otitis media, first a type C, later on a type B, okay? Consistent with fluid behind the drum. The word static compliance simply refers to the height of the pup tent, the height. How tall was your pup tent? So look at the picture here. Static compliance is how tall was it? Okay. Did you have a tall timp or was it a squat timp? Well, that is going to be an issue when we talk about the next middle ear pathology called otosclerosis. Otosclerosis. And let's look at otosclerosis next. At any rate. Acoustic reflexes, do you remember? Have you, do you remember what those are from anatomy class? The pulling of the middle ear muscles, putting a loud sound in the ear and waiting for the middle ear muscles to pull. What are those two muscles called? Tensor tympani muscle, stapedius muscle, remember those? Well, I'll stop sharing for a second and tell you this. Tympanometry itself has a couple of subtests. One is the tympanogram type. Was it type A, C, B? Another test is static compliance. What was the, the height of it? And another test is how much air is in your ear canal? Physical volume. PV, physical volume. Usually you have about a, a cubic centimeter and a half, one to one and a half cubic centimeters behind the end of your probe and the eardrum. There's a little pocket of air, right? Well, if you have a large physical volume of three or four centimeter, cubic centimeters, it must mean you got a hole in the drum. Because now the air in your eardrum, or the air between your eardrum and that probe tip of the tympanometer that you got stuck in your ear canal, that air is shared now with all the air in your middle ear space because you have a hole in your eardrum. So a large physical volume means perforated eardrum. 
See all the stuff you can pick out here? The fourth test in tympanometry. So the first one is type. Next one is height, static compliance. Next one is physical volume of air. And your tympanometer is automatically doing this. You're not doing anything. All you're doing is holding the probe. And it's going, do, 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 do. it's doing all of its stuff. Tympanometry is a non-behavioral test requiring no voluntary response on behalf of the client, unlike pure tone testing and unlike speech audiometry. There is no voluntary behavior. So the fourth test of tympanometry is acoustic reflexes. And they'll put a loud tone in the ear with the probe sticking in there. So now you're, you're no longer changing air pressure. Uh-uh, you're putting it at zero air pressure and you're putting a loud tone and you're trying to find out, did the tympanogram get more squat? Did it get shorter? If it got shorter, if it's static compliance got less, that's an acoustic reflex. Because what happens when those muscles pull? They stiffen the whole middle ear system. Remember, it's a stiffness dominated system, but during the acoustic reflex, it's even more stiff. And what did we say happens with what are, you, what are the axes of a tympanogram? The axes of a tympanogram are air pressure and compliance. Air pressure and compliance. So the height of your tympanogram during the acoustic reflex gets smaller. All right, good, good to know. Lots of stuff we're covering here, but it's all good. <clears throat> Your station tube might not function for properly for reasons other than otitis media. Okay? So all of this stuff, though, the, type, the four pieces. Tympanogram type, static compliance, acoustic reflexes will be absent if you've got otitis media because your whole middle ears are filled with pus. So you're not going to have an acoustic reflex, period. Your PE tubes, your pressure equalizing tubes, if they're working, if a person has tubes in his ear, you're going to have a large physical volume too, aren't you? Okay? Because the air behind the, the probe is shared with the air behind the eardrum. You've got a hole in your eardrum. Anyway, these words here, Valsalva and Toynbee maneuvers, that's holding your nose and blowing hard and making your ears pop. This one, you should put a star by it. Patulous or patent eustachian tubes. Those are eustachian tubes that are constantly open. They're not staying closed. And that might happen in some people who've lost a lot of weight. Maybe they're on chemotherapy for cancer. Maybe they've lost a lot of weight. And so unlike the normal situation where your eustachian tube is usually closed until forced open, this is the opposite. They're always open because there's not enough fatty tissue around the tonsils to keep them closed unless you swallow. So this person is going to complain about hearing speech, his or her own speech, really loudly, because the sound of their own voice is going to be going right up the open eustachian tubes into the middle ear. They're going to complain about hearing like they're hearing themselves like in a barrel. Hmm. Patulous or patent eustachian tubes. <clears throat> Cholesteatoma. That's caused by a perforation in the eardrum, and the perforated eardrum, okay, the perforated eardrum has not healed properly, especially near the bottom of the drum. And so I think I can show you this. I'll do it. I'll show it to you on a piece of paper and then share the screen. Cholesteatoma often happens. And I'll stop sharing screen here. Cholesteatoma often happens when you've got the eardrum, this is the eardrum, when you've got a perforation at the edge of the eardrum. Those are kind of dangerous because they don't tend to heal well. And the body is trying to close that hole. And what happens is, and we'll read our notes together, skin enters the middle ear space, often begins with a perforated eardrum. Skin from the eardrum itself enters the middle ear space. Skin from the outer layers of the drum 
you know, the, 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 the layer facing outward. Okay, remember the drum has three layers of skin, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. The ectoderm skin is now invading the middle ear space. The body's trying so hard to heal that hole, it overdoes it. And you get weird kind of cells. Causes a rapidly growing benign tumor, which can then become fatal. Now, otos, I mean, uh, cholesteatoma. Oma always means tuma. Okay? Cholesteatoma in your pictures. <clears throat> let's see if we can find one here. There's a picture of a cholesteatoma. Okay? So it's the classic white cheesy appearance of a cholesteatoma, which in this case is largely filling the middle ear space and is seen through a perforated eardrum. The inflammatory process that cholesteatoma incites or causes may lead to bony erosion and complication of hearing loss, mastoiditis, facial palsy, labyrinthitis, meningitis, brain abscesses. Well, how far is the roof is the brain from the roof of the middle ear space? An eighth of an inch. So if a doctor finds a cholesteatoma, it is removed immediately. Okay, it may be a benign tumor, but it will be lethal. It will kill you. See if we can find another uh, cholesteatoma. Let's see. Here. On rare occasions, squamous epithelium may become trapped in the middle ears during early development. The result is a slowly growing epidermal ep skin cyst, the only indication of which is seen here. See if I can move this guy. I hate it when that thing pops up. Okay. <clears throat> the only indication of which may be seen here, a white tumor behind the drum. Behind the anterior, so in here. Kind of like a, kind of strange. A doctor's looking in going, this isn't right. Somehow skin from the outer ear canal, the outer layer of the drum, the eardrum trying so hard to heal the perforation that grew along the edge, somehow skin has migrated into the middle ear space, and that is the problem. So let's look at our notes now. Keep sharing screen. Immediate surgery is the treatment of choice. Otorrhea may stink. You got to remove all cholesteatoma tissue because the whole condition can repeat. Don't worry about this here. Couldn't care less. Sometimes the pars flaccida becomes sucked inward, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about it. Here, if skin from the outer tympanic membrane is introduced to the middle ear space, it's always bad news. So now you've covered three sort of up middle ear pathology, sort of, kind of. Okay? Otitis medio is the big one. Patulus or patent eustachian tube we covered very quickly. Cholesteatoma is the third one. Bell's palsy is paralysis of the seventh facial nerve. Now, the seventh facial nerve can cause flaccid paralysis on one side of the face. And I don't really know why we're mentioning that really with middle ear pathology so much because it's a nerve, okay, and it goes through the internal auditory meatus. What is the IAM? It's the tunnel of bone through which the eighth nerve travels to leave the cochlea and go to the brainstem. Remember that? The eighth cranial nerves, one for this ear, one for that ear. Outer ear, middle ear, inner ear. Eighth nerves to the brainstem. And the tiny tunnel that the eighth nerve goes through is called the internal auditory meatus, as opposed to the outer ear canal called the external auditory meatus. And the seventh facial nerve goes right through that as well. So many times, if someone has an eighth nerve tumor, the face may also be kind of paralyzed because the seventh facial nerve controls the cheeks. It also innervates the acoustic reflex, doesn't it? The stapedius muscle is innervated by the seventh cranial nerve. 
So the first Bell's palsy may have absent acoustic reflexes, facial paralysis, okay? But again, I'm not really sure why we're, that, that particular section is mentioned here at the outer and middle ear unit, but nonetheless. Now let's finish our coverage of the middle ear by looking at otosclerosis. So I'm going to carry on here and move along on our screen. Whoa, went a little too far. Otosclerosis. Oto, ear, sclerosis, hardening. Now what the heck is that? Well, read it here. It's fairly common but not as common as otitis media, not nearly. Hereditary in most cases. So if mom or dad has it, chances are at least one of the kids is going to have it. Rare in children, develops as a young adult. From puberty to age 30, that's when it hits. So unlike otitis media, which is a childhood thing, otosclerosis is not, and it's not an infection. It's most common in the white race, most common in women, noticed especially during pregnancy because the little fetus is absorbing calcium from mummy, and so you've gotten a problem with the middle ear, and we'll talk about it. It's the formation, it may affect one or both ears, but usually both. Maybe in different degrees, though. Formation of a new spongy growth of bone. Look what I'm highlighting there. That's why the term sclerosis is a dumb term, because sclerosis means hardening. But otosclerosis isn't a hardening. Otosclerosis looks like this. Let's see if I can find it here. Let's see if I can find it. Where is it? Oto Here it is. Otosclerosis. Let's keep scrolling down here. There you go. Here's a picture of otosclerosis. Notice the formation of spongy growth of bone around the foot plate of the stapes. Okay? And it's a, not a hard bone, unlike the term sclerosis. It's, they should call it otospongiosis. Okay, or what do uh, postmenopausal women get? Osteoporosis, okay, of the spine. You could almost think of it like that, an osteoporosis of the middle ear, especially the foot plate <clears throat> of the stapes, a porous growth of bone around the foot plate of the stapes. So sclerosis, meaning hardening, is actually a misnomer. Nonetheless, the main treatment of choice for otosclerosis is a stapedectomy. They go in and remove the stapes, and they put in a prosthesis. Weird, huh? And the way that they do it, and here's what's going to happen. They'll get a conductive hearing loss, all right. Here, this is a typical otosclerosis. Notice the hearing loss by air conduction is flat. Once again, similar to otitis media, but instead of the air conduction scores rising a little bit at 2000 hertz due to the resonance of the middle ear ossicles, you've got a drop in bone conduction at 2000 hertz. Hmm, why would that be? The reason is, let's look at our notes very carefully because this is one thing you need to memorize in hearing disorders 125. There's certain real sticking points, and this is another one of those. Let's share screen and look at our notes and read all about otosclerosis there. Formation of new spongy growth of bone over the stapes foot plate. Osteospongiosis is actually a better name because sclerosis means hardening. Sometimes the spongy growth covers even the crura of the stapes and even gets to the round window. Clients may show a bluish tint to the whites of their eyes, as with other bone diseases. I never knew that. Hmm. The foot plate of the stapes becomes partially seized or fixed in the oval window. Seized or fixed. It can't move. So you've got a conductive hearing loss. Okay, because there's a physical blockage of the middle ear moving. 
the foot, the, the ossicular chain, the malleus, incus, and stapes cannot move in and out of the oval window as a unit anymore because the foot plate of the stapes is seized or fused into the round window and into the oval window. Remember, the growth of bone has surrounded the entire oval window and may even get down to the round window down here. Back to the notes. Results in a mostly conductive hearing loss. Clients complain of difficulty hearing while chewing, complain about ringing in the ears. Sometimes the eardrum might look quite normal, but sometimes you might even see what's called Schwartz's sign, which is sort of a reddening of the promontory. And when you look at that in this picture, it's not really evident, but I'll try and make it larger at times. Now, this is the round window. This is the oval window. And here's the promontory right here. So oval window, promontory, round window. This is not showing Schwartz's signs, but you might end up seeing it this way. The promontory may become highly vascularized. Lots of blood vessels have lined the promontory. Part of the problem with otosclerosis, one of the signs of otosclerosis. So when you're looking with an otoscope through the eardrum, you might see that re a reddening, which is not shown in this picture, okay? But you might see a reddening of the promontory. So it's like you're looking through a bathroom window and you kind of see a reddishness. It means the eardrum itself isn't red, but you're seeing the vascularized promontory through the tympanic membrane. Okay. Read your notes here. Otosclerosis, put a star by this. Otosclerosis and bone conduction hearing thresholds. Put a star by this. When you are testing for bone conduction, putting an oscillator behind your ear, three things give rise to it. I'll stop sharing so I can talk and then we'll look at the notes. If you put an oscillator on the mastoid bone and deliver a tone by bone conduction, there's three things happening. One is called distortional bone conduction. It means you're vibrating the cochlea through the bone. Duh. Okay, so you hear. The second one's called inertial. And this means, remember now, how are the ossicles attached to the, to the skull? With ligaments, remember? They're not fused to the skull. There's ligaments. So the eardrum is attached to the malleus and the upper part of the malleus has a ligament. The incus is attached to the malleus, and it has a ligament. The stapes is attached to the incus, and it's the foot plate is in the oval window, and it also has a ligament. So the ossicular chain is not fused to the skull. It's connected to the skull, but it's not welded on. So when I deliver a tone through bone conduction, the guy's hearing it with distortional bone conduction because I'm vibrating the, the cochlea through the skull. But inertial means normally when I'm vibrating the mastoid, the ossicles are moving back and forth a little bit behind, not totally with the skull because they're not attached to the skull. So when I'm vibrating the skull with something on the mastoid bone, the ossicles are, are wiggling too, but a little bit out of sync because they're not stuck onto the skull. So they're actually moving back and forth a little bit in and out of the oval window, but a little bit behind the vibration of the skull. This means I'm pushing the stapes in and out of the oval window a little bit. So that's the second contribution to how we hear by bone conduction. And the third contribution as to how we hear by bone conduction is when I'm vibrating the skull, there's a tiny column of air moving in and out of my ear canal. You can't see it, but a little tiny, and that little column of air that's now vibrating in my ear canal is actually pushing against the eardrum, helping me hear a little bit. So you've got distortional, which is the big elephant, and then you've got a little monkey on its back called inertial and another little monkey on its back called 
uh, osseotympanic. Okay, so you've got those three contributions giving rise to your bone conduction hearing. Well, when you've got otosclerosis, so here's those three things, osseotympanic, inertial, distortional. Distortional is the big one. Osseotympanic is a lesser contribution, so is inertial, okay? But when you've got otosclerosis, your bones are fused to the skull because of that soft, spongy growth of bone. And so now you no longer have inertial contributions to bone conduction, and you no longer have osseotympanic. Those two contributions are gone. You used to have three contributions to the best way that you hear by bone. This one's now gone. This one's now gone. All you've got is distortional. And so, ossicular fixation with otosclerosis affects the osseotympanic bone conduction and inertial bone conduction. Only distortional remains. And what happens then? The resonance of the middle ear ossicles is 2,000 hertz, and therefore you've got a notch at 2,000 hertz. Let's put that in English so you can see it instead of just hearing about it. Okay, we'll make this guy bigger. Remember, bone conduction, and we'll finish with this in just a few minutes, okay? Bone conduction hearing. If you've got good bone conduction hearing, you've got normal hair cells, and you've got all three contributions to how we test bone conduction, okay? We test bone conduction by putting an oscillator on the mastoid bone. When we do that, you've got three contributions. Distortional, I'm wiggling the cochlea inside the skull. Inertial, when I'm vibrating the skull, the ossicles are lagging a little bit behind, pushing in and out of the oval window a little bit, improving my bone conduction again. And osseotympanic, when I'm vibrating the skull with the mastoid oscillator, I'm making a tiny column of air move, push, moving back and forth in the ear canal, pushing against the drum. Those three contributions make my bone conduction perfect. Good. But when I've got otosclerosis, I have a porous growth of bone around the footplate of the stapes, so now my inertial contribution to bone is gone, and my osseotympanic contribution is gone because now the whole ossicular chain is welded to the skull. There is no lagging difference, and the osseotympanic, the little column of air, screw that, that's gone too because the ossicular chain is frozen in place. And what's the resonance of the ossicles of the middle ear? 2,000 hertz. Therefore, you will get a drop in bone conduction hearing at 2,000 hertz. And that's called Carhartt's Notch, named after Raymond Carhartt, the father of audiology. And he noted this as an artifact. Car Carhartt's Notch does not repeat not mean hair cell damage at 2,000 hertz. It's got nothing to do with it. Carhartt's notch is an anomaly. It's an artifact of the way we test bone conduction hearing and the unique pathology that is otosclerosis. That's what Carhartt's notch is from. It's an artifact of the way we test bone conduction and the unique pathology that is otosclerosis. So please do not interpret this as a sensory neural, hair cell damage, poorer bone conduction, really. Uh -uh, it's an artifact, okay? But it's an earmark of otosclerosis. So unlike otitis media, where there's an improvement in air conduction due to the resonance of the middle ear ossicles, with otosclerosis, there's a drop in bone conduction scores as a result of the pathology. And that happens at the resonance of the middle ear ossicles. All right, good stuff. So now let's kind of look what else. This is out of a textbook showing another case of otosclerosis. 
And again, the bone, the bone conduction, uh, what do you call symbols are weird here. But again, the hearing loss is fairly flat and Carhartt's notch appears at 2000 Hertz. Interestingly enough. So here's something when you've got otosclerosis, you're going to have a very small tympanogram. It, the peak will be over zero. Yep, the peak is going to be over zero like normal. There's no problem with air pressure. Remember, it's not an infection. What are you going to have? A type A, but stiff. Your static compliance will be low. Your static compliance will be low. Okay, the peak will be over normal air pressure. You're getting the, 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 the middle ear is least stiff when air pressure is even steven on both sides of the drum. And otosclerosis is not a vacuum and it's not pus. There's no infection whatsoever. So the peak of the tympanogram will be found right at normal air pressure, meaning that the air pressure behind the drum is also room normal air pressure. So when you have the probe in the ear, air pressure being room air pressure, and behind the drum, air pressure is room air pressure. So you will have least stiffness, most compliance, over normal air pressure, but the whole middle ear system will be stiffer than usual, giving you a normal type A tympanogram, but an overly squat one, a type AS. Now you've got four types of tympanograms. How do you like that? These pictures here are just showing you pictures of what they do for a stapedectomy. They measure the length to find for the prosthesis. Then they start making a hole in the foot plate of the stapes. Then they cut the crura and cut the tendon. They remove the stapes, leaving the foot plate in. They'll put a, a, a titanium thing into the hole and they'll plug it up with fat so it doesn't leak. <laughs> so that's a stapedectomy. Stapedectomy. Otosclerosis shown here once again. The free movement of the ossicular chain may be impeded by the abnormal growth of spongy bone on the ossicles. This freezes the stapes foot plate to the oval window. Most commonly freezes the stapes to the oval window. So these slides here are talking exactly what we did in our notes about the unique three con contributions to bone conduction. Please read this carefully. Otosclerosis knocks out two of those. Okay, so again, it's highlighted in the notes, plain to see. Here's a mixed hearing loss. A mixed hearing loss. Well, we've gone on long enough today. What I plan to do, because this section took a little bit longer than I thought, but that's fine. It's all good. We're going to finish this unit next week, and then we'll launch into the next unit in the inner ear. Okay, so we'll finish this unit next week. It took a little bit longer than two weeks. That's okay. It's good for us all in 125 to learn hearing disorders and to learn it well. So I've taken my time to try and explain as clear as possible, but I will end the session now and we'll pick up here next week because what we're going to talk a little bit about is, well, here's some examples I'm giving you stuff. Uh, a couple of slides here. Let's see what else what I want to just, I want to just see where we are here. I want to cover a couple of points next week. One of them is about even disarticulated ossicles. Look at this. This is what we'll talk about next week as well. Come on, thing, go away. Okay, just look here. All right, look at this. Eardrum, ear canal, malleus, incus, and it's come away from the stapes. You've got disarticulated ossicles. Maybe the person had an accident, was in a car that rolled over. Who knows? That person's going to have a, an overly compliant tympanogram, like a stovepipe. It's going to be taller than normal. The static compliance will be very large. And that's your fifth type of tympanogram, an AD. Type A, the peak is over normal air pressure, but it's associated with an overly compliant middle ear, kind of like one that's like, 
It's over. It's not very stiff. A, D. So you got five types of timps. Type A, type C, type B, type A, S, type A, D. See you next week. All right. Make sure you watch this. And good idea, watch it twice. All right. Stop recording now.